cloud week 12 part two recording this to the cloud Am I right? no, it's up there so shishi tell vanessa where you're from hello vanessa oh this is shishi uh i <laughs> i'm from michigan originally from china but kind of Everyone know I'm kind of a Michiganer. Oh, where are you from? I'm from China. I am from Indiana, <laughs> kind of, because I graduated from the master program here. And your friend, she brought a friend. Uh, I'm, I'm Yutin. I'm from Taiwan. I'm interested in this class, so I come here. Thank you. Okay, Christian, you've already done Indianapolis. So Christian's my TA. So there's, we have one, two, three TAs. So we have maybe three students here, are actually students in this class and the rest are all TAs and friends. So, <laughs> um, Charity. The joys of asynchronous uh, learning. <laughs> that's so true. Uh, hi, I am currently living in Maryland, but I am originally from the the Midwest. So I grew up in Chicago and my family's now out in, my parents are out in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So I'm, I've, I'm an Indiana Hoosier at heart. I like corn. <laughs> Vanessa spent some time in Chicago, right? How many years? Um, at different points in time, all told probably six or seven. High school years or college years? Is college Northwest, years. Northwestern? Northwestern, college and post-college. Actually, it would be wait, four for college and three post-college. Julie, tell Vanessa where you're from. Hi, uh, I'm Julie. Um, at the moment, I'm in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, but I'm originally from Sri Lanka. Thanks. And he's science ed. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you too. Thanks. And Charity, what's your major? I'm a, the doctorate of education in IST. Oh, you are. So okay. EDD. EDD. Yeah. Halima, are you But only EDD? second year. Okay. <laughs> so Halima, are you master's or, or EDD? I am in my final semester of the master's program. Woo! Um, I am a Hoosier through and through. Um, yeah, so I love cornfields, just like charity. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also in Northern Indianapolis, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Kim, so there's actually four students from my class here. Kim. So I am um, originally from Massachusetts, Rhode Island area, and that's where I right now am currently living part-time. And I am from uh, upstate New York, just outside of Albany. I'm on sabbatical leave for my job for the year to go back to school. So I'm currently mooching off of my parents. <laughs> A lot of people have been mooching off of their parents during the pandemic. So, I mean, all good, right? So she's studying animal science at SUNY Cobble Skill. Is that right? Yeah. So SUNY Cobble Skill, and I'm a, an associate professor of animal science. Uh, and I teach a variety of different courses. My main focus is dairy, cattle management, and reproduction, animal reproduction. You know, that's stuff that we don't hear about all that much in this field, but why not? Yeah, exactly. When we went to the pandemic, I decided, uh, yep, I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> so, um, and I was really excited that I was given a full year sabbatical leave. We have not had a faculty member given a full year of sabbatical leave at the SUNY school that I'm at, which is the smallest SUNY school in about five years. So this was a big deal. Well, congratulations. That sounds pretty wonderful. I, I, um, I taught at UB for a year, a long, long time ago. My uh, fiance is currently in Buffalo right now, heading across the border to Canada to work for the week. So I'm quite familiar with UB and, and Buffalo. It's a beautiful campus and, and it's a really cool area, especially Go Bills. Yeah, and I remember there was a lot of good Italian food there too. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Also, also spend time in Vermont. How many years in Vermont? Or just your mother lives in Vermont? My mother lives in, in Vermont. So, and she moved there um, my freshman year of college. So I, I never really lived in Vermont. I did have a Vermont driver's license though for a period of time. I've just been coming home to Vermont for a long, long time. So Vanessa lived in California at, at, when she was at San Diego State University as an assistant professor. She's lived in Florida ever since then as an associate, now a full professor at Florida State in Tallahassee. She's lived and gotten a driver's license in Vermont, as we just heard, and also lived in Hoosierville here in the late 1990s, uh, taking classes like this particular class. And... Um, finding that it was an interesting enough topic to do some research on. Uh, some studies with myself and some uh, many kind of summative kind of overview book chapters and things like that. We did the article you might have read in this class on massive multiplayer online gaming for the Department of Defense, a real long paper. That's uh, uh, her as the co-author to that one. It's been cited a lot. Um, and we did this special issue of etr and d together, which you read the first two weeks of the semester, in, which includes an article that she wrote on social media and looking at a scoping review of the research on social media. So in, in addition to living here in Bloomington, Indiana, she lived in Chicago. So Illinois, Chicago, New York, she lived in New York, going to Syracuse University for her master's degree and Vermont and Florida and California. Are there other states that you've lived in that you're not telling me about? Maybe Alabama for a, a week? You're, you're starting to sound like a creepy stalker there, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sort of lived in Alabama for, um, my, my husband, um, when I met him, was a faculty member at UA. So um, we did the, we had the two body problem for a little, it and um it was after after our daughter was born and i was on maternity leave i stayed there and then i spent a year of doing crazy back and forth driving six hours door to door um but i'm happy to report that my husband got hired here at florida state with um you know with rank and tenure and there are truly some happy endings that happen in academia, even if you don't hear about them often enough. So I've told them a little bit about your research, Vanessa, um, but you've done some late some research lately with the OER project for open textbooks because Florida State had some monies for that. You've done online learning research. You've done some MOOC research, uh, actually, and um, a lot of social media. Uh, what, what other areas am I missing on? Social network analysis, um, what else? Yeah, I mean, the thread that runs through all of my work has been um, an interest in how people use online technologies to, um, to build community, to develop networks, um, and share knowledge with each other to engage in different knowledge activities. I mean, it's really, that's, it's the knowledge activities that are at the core of it, but then surrounding that you've got the need to have community or network, right? The two are very different um, things. Um, identity issues come up in my work because when you're online, you have to let people know that you're online and who you are and you know, choose which part of yourself you're going to share online. Um, I actually, so Kurt, I made, I made a slide deck that walks through a couple of different things um, that I could yep. share if you want. I focus on social media stuff because that was what you told me. Yep. So I, there's a couple of things we should do before you do the slide deck because we have mm -hmm. two, two more people show up, two more students. Uh, so God showed up, has come. And Nelson, who just uh, uh, got accepted into the University of Houston doctoral program and is heading there after this finishes his master's degree. Everyone, big round of applause for Nelson. And uh, I had a chance to talk to my friends at University of Houston about that. Uh, before we go to Nelson and go, I want to mention that like traveling ed man myself, Vanessa's traveling ed woman, she likes to go to Portugal in particular and to Thailand, right? Those are the two big, what other countries are your favorites? Copenhagen. Uh, so Denmark has been coming up a lot lately and I'll be there in a few months. Um, Bring me, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I love Copenhagen. 
<laughs> I'll tell you that story later. Uh, Nelson, you want to introduce yourself to Vanessa? Tell them what your major and, and what you're doing and where you're from. You're muted, Nelson. He might have stepped away. There you go. Hello? We hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, right now I'm a little bit busy, but quick introduction is um, my name is Nelson. I'm getting my senior, sorry, my, I'm a senior in the master's program here at IU, getting uh, my degree in instructional system technology. Um, I'm interested in distance learning, gamification theory, and a little bit of CRP, culturally relevant ped pedagogies and how it could all be intertwined together at the higher education level and at the K-12 education level. He's also interested in urban schools. And I think about five more, if I read your uh, CV, there's a whole bunch of things that, and everything Vanessa's gonna talk about tonight, he'll be interested in, because he reads everything. Ah, can you tell Vanessa about yourself? Um, sure, hi, um, I am a third year at the student, uh, but I work at IU. Um, my full-time job is the uh, director of IT at Cali School of Business. So a lot of the learnings that I have in the program actually have a real world application. So that has been one of the passions to pursue the degree. Um, on the side, uh, I do enjoy teaching. I'm actively teaching at least one course per semester just to keep my tab on the learning and instruction side. So I think it's not a lot of people at IU who simultaneously were the head of staff, faculty, and student. I haven't seen one, so and there's a quick introduction. I want to put a challenge to this whole class. I want everyone to type a question in the chat window. Don't hit enter. I just want you to type in a question about social media or about anything, any topic. And she, Vanessa knows pretty much everything. So, But in particular, she's an expert on social media. I would like you to type it in and we'll hit all enter at the same time. And I want Vanessa to, to answer one or two of them and then present your slides. So anything about my, my presentation an hour ago where I went through all the research, you might ask her about that. You might ask her about her article if you read that today that I sent you or anything else. So I wanna get us started with, with all of you inputting here. Um, so I'll give you another 15 seconds to type a question uh, for, for us. And we have a Hollywood score, just one, two, three, four, 12 people. Great, just fits perfectly here. So go ahead and hit enter. Hmm. Don't be shy. <laughs> people are still formulating, okay. And by the way, we have a Jamboard for more questions once we get going here. This is just, we can, you can also post it to the Jamboard once Vanessa starts presenting. You want me to start answering some of them, like rapid fire answers for you? Oh, oh I don't see any questions. So maybe my-, my Oh, I see a bunch of questions. Okay, so my, my chat I'll, is kind I'll of- I'll also up. add them to uh, the Jamboard just so we can have a record of the questions. Yeah, why don't you do that? Oh, I see the questions now. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why don't you pick a couple and answer them and then we'll move on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, can yoga on Peloton be considered a, a forum for informal learning? I would say potentially, it really depends on what's happening. Uh, I mean, doing yoga with the Peloton app doesn't necessarily mean that one's engaged in informal learning, but they might be. Um, it you know certainly fits the informal context. It, it's not really network learning, although I mean, Peloton has the capacity to do network stuff um nobody seems to actually do that and i know on my bike i was just like yeah i i don't want to activate the little camera feature on there even though i could do it with my two sisters and that would probably be the least creepy way to, of doing it but it's still just yeah it just it doesn't seem right just right there why don't you um, try two more before you go okay um I'm going to pick what are the challenges of using social media in education? And I'm going to take that as a formal education thing. I think that some of the biggest challenges that we need to um, deal with are, uh, you know, first checking our assumptions as educators. That we make a lot of assumptions that, um, you know, just because those young folks are using social media, they're going to want to use social media for their classes. I, uh, you know, not necessarily. 
Um, in many cases, they don't want to. They may like some of the features that are on social media. They may like having feeds and the ability to like things and to at mention people, but it doesn't mean that they want their class to be taught on Facebook. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is um, you know, dealing with people's privacy. Um, it, you know, some of it dictated by our, our laws here in the US, the FERPA laws and, and making sure that, you know, students are aware of what's happening on social media, um, how they're representing the, the class, um, intellectual property laws come into place there as well. So you have to have a good handle on that stuff, not just yourself as an instructor, but you also have to pre prepare your students for learning in that environment if you're going to use um, a so an open social media space where anybody could be. So that's a big challenge. All right, I'm supposed to pick one more question. But before um, you do, Janessa, I'll point out last week in my other class, we had Tiagi, who you know, and he talked oh, about, Tiagi, Tiagi yeah. came in with a deck of cards and he talked about assumptions that were people are making about, you know, what's on the back of the card was, you know, and all, it was very good. It was, it was, is interesting that you mentioned assumptions. Yeah, so go ahead. Pick, pick well, up. I see another question that's about some assumptions. Basically, um, is it fair to comment on Gen Z students learning methods by older generation educators? You know, I've got to say, I don't buy into this whole generation thing. I I just don't. I think that it's it's what we make of it. It's what we choose to set for ourselves culturally. And we can shape the culture of learning, the culture of classroom to be what we want it to be. Um, you know, just, just because uh, we have folks right now who in their spare time are, you know, sitting here like this. And if my daughter were home right now, she'd be like, oh. Oh, oh, just swiping up nonstop, right? On TikTok or, um, but just because she's getting things in those little chunks doesn't mean that, that that's the only way she's gonna learn. Um, you know, are we gonna invoke the learning styles myth here to say that like, this is the only way these people can learn? How sad and self-limiting that is. And I think that we have an, an obligation as educators to, you know, give our students a more robust experience and set some expectations and to also learn from them because there are things they can teach us. Like you can learn in these little micro bits swiping on your phone, but it doesn't mean that that's the only kind of learning that can um, take place. So I think, you know, it's, it's fun to talk about generational differences and, you know, everybody likes to identify with their own generation and get into the generation wars. And certainly there are a ton of memes about that. But, you know, I don't really think that that holds true in terms of learning as much as we would like to suggest that it does. So we'll move on to those your slides and we'll come back to the rest of those questions because Christian's going to post them to the Jamboard. And Christian, you'll maybe put the questions that we, we haven't addressed um maybe put the ones we have addressed at the very top and underneath it put the ones we haven't addressed and then people can keep adding to them so go ahead that's good all right that sounds good and and i am entirely interruptible by the way i'd like everybody to know that um i love to answer questions and have conversations i tried to not make an overly formal slide deck but instead i want to kind of walk you through just some of the stuff that i do maybe to open up the scope of of questioning that would be available. And I also thought that for any of you who are doctoral students and who are thinking about being doctoral students, that it might be useful for you to get a little bit of a sense of the progression of a research agenda across a career and how somebody, you know, continues to connect back to their core, their core interests, but, you know, allows it to, the research agenda to grow and to, um, follow what's happening in the world and, and technology, um, and, and really, you know, following the findings from one study to the next as well. And sometimes responding to what you feel are institutional pressures because those are a very real thing as well. Um, and that's what I've done. So there, Kurt, I put it on there on my UIST 2001. Yeah. Um, in fact, I just had uh, my 21st doctoral student defend on the 21st anniversary of my defense date, which I thought was pretty cool. And today, which is, Four four for the date, my 22nd student defended. So if anybody likes to play with numbers, we just thought that that was kind of cool that that was the way it ended up happening. We did not plan the defenses for that date. Although my students like to pick my 
defense date when they can because they feel that it's an auspicious day. So um, they really do. They pick the date you defended on <laughs> as their date. They aim for it if they can get it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I've had a, I've had a few defend on that date. They they like to do that. It's kind of neat. I might try that. Mine's July 17. We're going to have to do that. Okay. See, that's yeah. not a time when you see a lot of defenses happening, right? But mine was March 30th. And a lot that's like that, that core time when people are defending to make it for the spring graduation date. Yeah. So, you know, people are kind of coming around the bend and they're like, yeah, probably sometime in March or April is when I'm going to defend. And they find out what my defense date was and they see if they can, can get my defense date. <laughs> Oh, Bell's birthday is the seventh. Oh, well, yours is June seventh. I'm trying July seventeenth. July seventeenth. That's yeah. okay. that's when all the faculty are on vacation and don't want to do a defense. Yeah. So, so the major topics that that I've researched over over time that relate to social media, um, I've done some stuff with professional development where I've looked at at bloggers, a little bit at conference tweets and and personal learning networks. I've connected back to formal learning, which I keep coming back to time and again. My dissertation focused on online learning, online courses, and, and I, but but still that interactive part, right? Because that's the core for me. It's always about how people are communicating and sharing knowledge and, and developing networks, forming communities with each other. Um, it's funny, the formal learning part, when I was a tenure um, earning person, I, I felt like that was what my institution wanted me to do. That was what I was supposed to do in the field. So I was doing that, that work, but I'm much more interested in the stuff that fits around the edges. And once I got tenure, I was like, I'm gonna do exactly what I want now. Um, but I connect back to formal learning a lot of the time for studies with my students who feel like they want to have more of that connection. Um, for the last five years, I've been doing a pretty big study with a group about um, teens and how they're using social media for informal learning and how this happens in the school to context, um, how it works with their um, information and, and um, transmedia literacies, the rules that govern that overall environment. And a, so a new line that actually came out of the team work um, has been focused on emotions because we noted that so many of the teen participants we've been working with were saying things like, you know, oh yeah, I was on Instagram for two hours yesterday. Oh, I feel so bad about that. Why do you feel bad? Why do you do things if you feel bad about them? What are these, what's going on with these emotions? Um, and we've actually um, developed a scale and we're working on identifying the context of the different emotions right now. So just to kind of walk you through a few of these things, blogging was, was probably my first departure from formal learning. And I spent uh, a lot of time looking at a community of academic bloggers online. And this was um, when blogging was a much more interesting thing to people than it is now. I once, so once if you look at the publication dates, you have to recognize that of course the data were collected earlier and then the publications um, you know, come out after that. So once Facebook became open to everybody, um, and Twitter came about and people started really using it, these folks migrated over into those spaces and most of them weren't keeping blogs anymore. But for a while, you know, it's like you could be on MySpace or maybe live journal or have a blog. So folks had blogs and um, I looked at how community was happening there through these interconnected blogs and the reciprocal comments that people were leaving. Um, I would look at identity development because a lot of these bloggers were using pseudonyms and developing versions of their identity in these spaces, which was part of how they got to know each other. Um, and also did activity systems analysis, which is this next slide, really looking at what is happening here as the bloggers are engaged with each other. And I, you know, I just put this on the slide because I wanted to show that that it really is a more complex activity once you start to um, to think about it. Like even just the rules that govern blogging were complicated because there were norms for blogging, but there were also academic norms, and all these people identified as academics, and so they're juggling that as they deal in, in the hierarchies, the hierarchies of the blog world and the hierarchies of academe. Because you'd have people show up as bloggers, and they'd be like, you know, oh yeah, well I'm a full professor of blah blah blah. How, how do how do I get a 
picture on here. You all have pictures and links. How do I do that? And um, <laughs> you'd have grad students who are like, yeah, I've been blogging here for three years. I, I hand coded my first blog. Yeah, before Blogger even existed and I could do yours too. And those were the people who had the power and the credibility. Whereas when you go back into the academic context, it turns itself the other way around. So it really was quite a complex system to investigate. Um, you know, so again, this is all just like stuff I'm happy to back? chat about. You want me to go back? Go sure. Back. So just for a site, for a context here, if you're gonna do research on triangles, the name of the person that to, to, to look for is Angus Lisa Strom. Lisa Yamagata Lynch. Is my former student as well. And she did her dissertation on this and has a book on this. Um, so it's activity theory. And the, is it Erno Angstrom? I forget Angstrom's first name. Ergo. Ergo. Um, so he's a Finnish guy, I believe. And he's been internationally well known for this, this approach, this methodology is basically Vygotsky, when he passed away in the 1930s, in 1934 or so, he passed away before he could fully flesh out his theory. And his students, Leontev and one other student, um, uh, Luria, uh, extended his work. And as they were extending his work, one of them may have worked with Engstrom, who extended it a step further. Uh, and that's creating this model to this, method, uh, this methodological approach to understand the activity plane. So Vygotsky was concerned with what, how to prompt or nurture development of learners by by scaffolding the environment, by providing the support structures and, and having learning proceed development. But how to understand that? Because instead of looking at fossilized skills, looking at test scores of students, looking down at the micro or looking up at the macro, the sociological point of view, the macro context, he was looking at the activity structures, what's happening, what's occurring when they're blogging when people are discussing in Canvas or in Blackboard. You know, so how do we understand that mid meso level, the mid level between the macro and the micro, and this becomes an instrument for doing so. It's not one that I use or can explain successfully because I, I, got a, I was the best B plus student my instructor ever had in geometry. I was not an A student in geometry. So, um, so Vanessa could maybe stop for a second and, and talk a little bit about Angstrom and about the use of this tool in educational psychology and educational technology research. I mean, how have you, how, have you used it personally? And um, have you been su successful? Or do you teach your graduate students how to use this in your graduate courses? I'm just curious. Yeah, actually, actually um, the two students who just defended these past two weeks chose to use this in their yeah. study. I certainly don't push people to use it, but it, it fit well with, um, with what they were trying to do. I think that activity systems analysis as, a, as an approach and, and activity theory as a theoretical framework is really useful when what you're trying to do is break down a complex system or and really under, understand this, or I should say, understand the systemic context in which an activity takes place. So if, if we were to work our way through the triangle here, you know, the subject that would be the person or the entity that's trying to accomplish an object that would be their goal at the end. But then you see there's also an outcome. And so the outcome is like whatever else happens, right? Somebody sets out to do something, they may or may not do that thing, but also a whole bunch of other things could happen along the way. Um, but then it happens in this larger context, all of these parts shape the way something is going to happen. So um, we have rules and rules, you know, we have to, you know, do we operate within the rules that we are given? Do we challenge the rules that we've given, right? Rules shape decisions that we make. And so that's an important part of the system to acknowledge. We have tools. Um, and even here, you can see the tools for the blogger activity system that I've put on, on this particular one. One is the technology. You could break that down into the hardware and the bandwidth and, and the software, but there's also genre and format, right? So 
the genre of writing was a tool, was a device. You can think of tools as processes and algorithms and all of these other things. Um, and again, the tools that are available shape the activity that is going to happen. If we go down to the community, the other people who you interact with along the way, they shape the activity in some way. And then the division of labor, right? The, who does what? as all of this happens. Um, and you know, so that refers back in some ways to the community, but not everybody in the community is necessarily doing something here. Some of them are just there and they kind of, by their very presence shapes what's happening. Um, so those are the points that we try to identify. And once you've identified you know, what are these different points in the system that help shape the activity that's taking place, you can start to identify um, tensions. Sometimes they get called contradictions that exist within the system. And so you can have um, these first generation ones like the A arrow, which is the rules coming back on itself. So the blog norms and the academic norms could be in conflict with each other. Um, you know, it's like, you know, some of it was dealing with the hierarchy stuff. Um, sometimes there, there were challenges here about um, citing sources, providing appropriate references and the way that we do that. So the way that we do it academically is not the same way that we would do it on blogs. And some of the blog people wanted to go under the radar. So they didn't want you to do that. So, you know, we'd had to be careful and respectful about that. Um, you, then you could also have them between different points. So like um, B is going between the rules and um, the object and the outcome over here. And so for some of the people, they were there to network. That was, they, they articulated that was their reason for doing it. But there were privacy norms among the bloggers. If you knew who somebody's name was in real life, you didn't out them. So how do you network with people? Right? Like, what if, what if you think like, wow, I'd really like to collaborate with you on a research project, but we have to do that as real name people, not as pseudonym blog people. How do we make that happen? Um, and so those were, were some of the challenges. Um, does that help explain how activity systems works? Oh, totally. And there's so much yeah. more to read it. And, and Lisa Yamagata Lynch has a really great book that's a, a, a pretty solid primer for if you want to um, do this. My library has it um, as an ebook for download. So I think it's quite possible that your library would as well. Yeah, IU probably, and she's an IU grad. She's a double, she was a double major in ed psych with me and, and IST uh, before I moved to IST. And, and we had a project called Ticket, which was technology integration for teachers in effect. And she used this for her dissertation, analyzing the impact of the ticket program on teachers and on the community, on the schools, and so forth, which led to her future, her later work, and to the book. So I am very familiar with the model. We're going to in week fifteen hear from Rob Elliott at IUPUI. He studied mobile learning and defended on February eighteenth, and he's used activity theory for his analysis. So he'll be coming. So we'll be coming back to that maybe when he shows us, and he might come twice during the rest. Of the rest he might speak to us twice. I'm not sure yet, but yeah, actually, so you're from Rob. I have two other students using activity theory. So it is becoming uh, well used within our field. So I want you to just go back and just point that out. You can go on. Um, yeah, it's real nice if you've got a rich qualitative data set and you're trying to explore the systemic nature of an activity, for sure. All right, so um, some of the formal learning stuff that I've done, and, and these have tended to be more one-shot studies or just kind of following things along from term to term um, across some classes. I get my doctoral students involved in a lot of these. Um, like we, we looked at um, getting students to tweet in a class and whether or not it, um, having an instructor model it for them was going to um, help encourage more tweeting and tweeting of a very particular nature. The, the results, yeah, a little bit, sort of, not so great. Um, we've looked at social bookmarking and how that helps students engage in course readings and how it works to develop different tagging systems within courses. And this ties back to like basic info literacy skills for students and whether or not they have those skills, which is it turns out they're increasingly important as you get out into the workforce, but we don't do a great job of teaching them. Um, with pre-service teachers, We've been doing some ongoing studies about um, 
teaching them to develop PLNs or personal learning networks and to learn about the array of professional development options that are going to be available to them once they become actual teachers. And it's a bit of a challenge because as, as pre-service teachers taking a technology course in year one or two, that's still quite an abstraction for them about what it's going to be like when you become a teacher. Um, so we've been working on how to get them there. And that's what the visuals are here. Um, this is one student's depiction of how, how they envision um, interacting with their um, PLN as a teacher. That's the most detailed one. It's all the way over on the right. The middle one with it's got the least on it was where they were at the beginning of class. And the one that's a little bit bigger, that's where the student said they were at um, when the class ended. And so we've been tracking some of that and using visual depictions for it. Um, I did a study with a colleague about um, Facebook use. Uh, this was at a time when a lot of people were saying, you know, oh, maybe we should just use Facebook as an alternate to Canvas or Blackboard for class discussion. All the students would like it, right? They're all on Facebook. This is what they want. Um, yeah, well, yeah, but you, you know how you find out for sure? You collect the data on it. And, um, you know, it was a survey study. It was pretty interesting because the students um said you know yeah they 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 don't want their class and to be connected to their instructor in any way really even in a facebook group some of them feel really strongly about that it's not just about being friends they don't even want to be in a group with you like they don't want you to see their profile photo and while they look up their instructors they don't think that the instructors will look them up and you know one of them even said well that's creepy which kind of sums it all up and they don't necessarily want to be connected to their classmates either i mean some do but some don't and the ones who don't really don't and then you have your group of non-users and for the most part they are what i would call principled non-users they have a reason why they don't use facebook um and so it's an uncomfortable space I mean, for that reason i would never ask anybody to use facebook in a class setting. And then you have to ask yourself as an instructor, well, you know, even if I tell people like, you know, yeah, you can opt out. Well, are you creating a space where there's going to be an equity issue for your students? Are you, you, you know, is it really that important to use Facebook and either have some of your students be uncomfortable using Facebook or have them miss out on some of the things that's happening in the class space? Because Facebook is just like, unlike so many other things. If I, if I ask students to tweet, I could tell a student to set up an account by creating um, a burner account on Gmail and then sign up under whatever name you want to on, um, on Twitter. I don't care if you call yourself Mickey Mouse, be Mickey Mouse if you want to. Uh, nobody has to know who you are, except for me. It doesn't conflict with your regular real name account or whatever else you want to have. But Facebook terms of service say you will have one name, one account, and it will be a real name account. And I've had instructors say, well, see, you just tell them to sign up for a second account anyway, or to lie about their name. Think, think about that as a moment for a moment. Like, really? As an instructor of technology, I should tell my students to violate terms of service. What kind of an example would I be setting if I did that? And do I really need to use Facebook that badly? I, I, you know, I don't think the, the advantages are there. Christian, I see your hand is up there. Do you have a question about this or a yeah, comment? Um, so a couple things. Um, how did you deliver the survey? <laughs> um, it was electronic. Okay. But not through Facebook. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, <laughs> was it through Facebook? <laughs> Yes, we always have a comment from Nelson. Nelson, go ahead. I see that Nelson used Edmodo and Edmodo is actually a pretty nice tool to use because it has feeds and some of those social media like qualities, but it can be siphoned off into a private space for a class. You know, and again, people can set up accounts just for Edmodo. It doesn't have to have any conflict or what we call context collapse with um, their other interactions and their other accounts in online spaces. So the teens and their social media use. Um, 
we got really interested. This is me and um, Stacy Rutledge, who's a faculty member in Ed Leadership and Policy Studies. And we've been collaborating. We had a conversation one day um, and, and she was telling me that she, she does a lot of work in high schools and schools of systems. And she kept saying, there's something this social media stuff though. And, and I just don't know what it is. And I don't know how to, how to study that. And I said, well, I do. I mean, I don't work with teens, but yeah, I, I know how to go in and do that. And so we, we partnered up and we started looking at how social media fits into the school context, but not in the classroom, right? We're not so interested in the, like, how could I use this for a lesson? And I do that with the formal learning stuff, you know, whatever. It's not so interesting. It's just another tool for another thing. But you know, teens have their phones out all the time and schools try to, you know, ban it. They, they, you know, no phones. We're going to block social media on the Wi-Fi. We don't want to see anybody posting during the school day, but you can't get rid of it because teens will still talk during the school day, even without phones or any access to social media. They'll talk about what happened on social media last night. So it's still present. And then they'll go home and they'll post on social media about what happened that day at school. So you can't get rid of it, but can you harness it? And I think I saw a question up there somewhere too about like, how can we help teens use this better? Well, we're trying to figure out like, do they actually know what they're doing? And if we wanted to teach them things about it, what would we want to teach them? Um, we did activity systems analysis for another study looking at the, um, how teens use social media and the complex environment that they navigate when they do that, because it really is, very um, systemic for them. We looked at, at informal learning and actually the dissertation today was specifically about informal learning in affinity spaces um, because some teens are going out and, and learning some, and, and accomplishing some really fabulous things they generally don't tell anybody else about because they think nobody would be interested in it. Not their friends, not their parents, not their teachers, but they've developed expertise. They've developed these transmedia and digital literacy skills. Um, you know, if we could capture some of that, if we could harness that and help others learn about it, it would be super powerful. Um, we've captured them learning about social issues, reading the news, right? We say they don't read the news. Now we have some concerns here, right? Like, is the stuff that you read online accurate? Generally speaking, they know that they should wonder about that. Now, whether they care is another issue, but we'll leave that for another day. Um, and, and we've also looked at how they use social media for survival during the pandemic because it really was a lifeline. And, um, and what you're looking at here uh, is from some of our initial work. This is actually from before the, the pandemic and we were comparing 10th grade and 12th grade and seeing how the networks um, and uses evolved over time. And it's really interesting because the 10th graders are very into this stuff like, you know, block the parents and it's all of this, this secretive, actually very developmentally appropriate in terms of wanting privacy and private spaces. Whereas the 12th graders who were getting ready to go to college were much more focused on using social media as a tool and seeing the utility behind it and seeing the value of um, using their, their social media accounts to connect with people who they might also be connected with in real life and to, um, you know, for any number of those kinds of purposes. Um, the systematic review, Kurt said to be sure to talk a little bit about the systematic review um, on teens in the school context. And the, the trend lines that you see there at the bottom, the, the top one that goes way, way, way up. So that's um, publications over time. Th that one represents um, overall publications that, that we found that were relevant to the study. And the ones that are halfway down are the ones that were relevant in the school setting and just underneath it, relevant in the school setting and also empirical. And so what we found is, I mean, there's a lot about social media and teens that's been written, but it, a lot of it's not intersecting with school in a meaningful way. And yet that's a place that shapes who teens are and where they spend so much of their day. Um, people are not crossing disciplinary lines. And um, in most of these studies, it's just treated like, well, social media in this setting, social media in this setting. But the reality is that teens carry it around on their phone across every setting, and they don't think of it in that way. And I know that from my other research. So it's kind of problematic that, that the research that we have right now 
talks about it in these very narrow settings, doesn't use things like activity theory, and, and, and doesn't see the complexity of how teens are using social media. So there are a lot of missed opportunities for research there, or we should say future opportunities for research. Um, they did another systematic review on parents. It's the other side of teens, right? Um, because we started to see how parents were using social media for online support. And the trend lines on the bottom show that um, the bulk of the research in this area was about health. Um, parents connecting in either because they have kids who are sick or they have little kids and they were interested in developmental milestones and all, I mean, we, if you have little kids, you know that you're just like endlessly fascinated with them and their health and their development. And so there's a lot of focus on that. A lot less that's coming out about schools and parenting support, um, but you know, parents are using social media there are so many different parenting forums that are out there and we're not studying them. The, the, the top of that health trend line there is 20. And a lot of those studies um, about health are, are you know, forums for very specific um, diseases or you know, childhood cancers, for example, or, oh, the vaccination stuff. Right? There's a lot of stuff about, should I vaccinate my child that, um, and parents making those decisions. But there's not much that's going on right now about navigating um, how parents use social media to help them navigate these various parts of raising their child, um, even though it's happening. So again, there's another opportunity for research. And then I wanted to finish with the not published anywhere, proposed to some conferences at the moment, still collecting some of the data, the social media and emotion stuff. Um, I have a great group of undergraduate researchers who are working with me on this project. And we have been surveying and interviewing. Um, and so we found that for positive emotions, that um, a lot of people associate happiness with getting their accomplished, acknowledged through their social media feeds, either they're doing it or other people doing it. And then they separate that out a little bit. And pride is about the degree of response that you get, whether you posted it or somebody else did. Um, you know, like you posted a picture of yourself and you look cute and you got a lot of likes, then you feel pride of that for that. And there's a negative emotion on the other side. So, um, people said that they felt um, shame if they posted a picture where they felt cute and nobody liked it. That would trigger feelings of shame. Um, also, you know, if they got called out by people for doing different things, if people leave comments like, you know, whoa, you were up all night posting stuff, weren't you? They feel shame about that. They feel guilt when they um, post things that affect other people. The most common one that we got was, um, when people post photos in because they look cute in them, but one of their friends doesn't, and so they feel guilty about it, but it doesn't stop them from posting their own cute photo, which is kind of funny. And embarrassment is all about oversharing and accidental postings and things like that. So a little bit about the emotions there. We've actually um, developed a, a scale and it had great internal consistency. And with the scale, we found out that the... Uh, the um, female respondents were, uh, they were college students that we had um, more likely to feel negative emotions than were the male students. Um, in fact, there are a bunch of the male students who were sitting at the bottom saying basically, I have no shame for anything whatsoever. And um, yeah, happy to talk about any of it. Job. That's really, really ties in well with what I presented earlier and updates everyone to the current issues. Uh, so you're saying that last study is in co data collection or it's in uh, papers in review? Um, it's, we were collecting data and we were able to, um, you know, pull off some of the early findings and submit to conferences. Mm -hmm. um, Tell my students about that notion. Do you, when you're doing each of these studies, do you submit the multiple conferences? Do you divide pieces up of each study so you can go, you know, uh, or do you target conferences or the conferences come up and then you, then you write the proposal or is it some of both? 
Well, that, that was a lot that you just asked there, Kurt. Um, I, so first, I, I do not submit the same thing to multiple conferences, but sometimes one project is big enough. Like, you know, I might view it as one project, but underneath it all, there's actually enough that um, you would split it up. So for example, with the, the emotion stuff, um, there's a survey that's out and we're interviewing right now. The interview stuff is just, it's, it's active, it's ongoing. I haven't even touched any of that data. And it's, for us, it's related, but ultimately it's, I don't think it's gonna be connected to reporting the survey. It just doesn't make sense. And the survey is actually doing about three different things. And so at least right now for conferences, we're taking different parts of it in different places. And as I have written it up as conference proposals, I, they really feel like um, entities unto themselves. So there's the scale that I mentioned, which is part of it, but there are these open-ended items. And I'll tell you, we, we ran this survey through the, um, the, the study pool here. So it's undergraduates who are getting course credit for participating in it. And one of the things that I found is that, you know, although open items on surveys tend to not get answers when they are undergraduate students in the study pool who are trying to earn credit, you can put those items on there because they're motivated to finish the survey and get their credit. So you put the item on there, you can give that a minimum um, character count for it. So they actually have to say something of substance there and they they answer that. So we have all these open items um, about, you know, tell me a story that's associated with guilt in social media. Tell me a story or instance associated with embarrassment in social media use. And so that's that's where that little bit I just shared with you comes from is from all of those open items that we've been going through in coding. Um, so the the survey is still open, but there were conferences that I wanted to submit to, two in particular that oh, are- Tell us what conferences you like, um, and then I'll um, so you can see some questions, yeah. One of them was um, social media and society, which they've just announced is, um, I mean, the pandemic has changed things. And it used to be an annual conference. It's going to be this summer as a virtual conference. And then they're turning it into a conference that will only be every other year. So I looked and I was like, this is kind of the perfect study to take there. And, you know, if I wait until the, the data collection is 100% complete, then I'm just like sitting out a cycle. And really, I want to work on the manuscripts for this over the summer and and get that out because it's in the study pool. I plan on closing it when the study pool closes in another two weeks at the end of the term. So that's when I'll consider the survey data collection complete. So I proposed it to the conference. At that point I had, I don't know, like 200 responses. Right now I think it's at about 360 responses. So it's, it's continued to grow. Um, the other one, it's another interdisciplinary conference, the Association of Internet Researchers um i know you like that one was it in japan or something that you traveled to or i went to it when it was in in korea i've korea, gone a few right. times over the years i kind of cycle in and out i i enjoy going to interdisciplinary conferences as you can see my interests tend to be interdisciplinary i like to to um you know see those spaces see those cracks that we're not necessarily looking at but that affect our everyday lives and start to ask questions about them so i find it very useful to go to these places and, and you know, like be with the communications researchers, be with the iSchool researchers, be with the sociology researchers, um, because they they push me in new and different ways. And they give me ideas, um, ideas about theory, ideas about method that I bring back and share with my students. We should go to the student questions in here. Um, did you have a question that you posted for Vanessa earlier that she didn't answer that you would like her to address now? Um, I have a question really quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead, Nelson. Um, so I remember reading about social media and how it's difficult to implement it in class because you have to learn about the you know property rights and intellectual property and just all these copyright issues. So I was wondering if for teachers interested in using it regardless, 
is there anything that they can consume to kind of catch up on all their rights like you know really fast or do they have to do the research themselves and figure it out and then implement it because that's kind of a lot of work and it's kind of dissuading if they have to do all that legwork just to make class a little bit more interactive and more fun you know well i mean i think that 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 pushes us to think about why we're using a technology in the first place and you know should we just be using it because we think it's going to be fun i would want to use it because of the affordances of the technology one of the things that i like about using social media in a class context is the way that it facilitates open sharing I mean, just unlike anything that you really see in a learning management system, they tend to be so locked down. Um, when we switched from Blackboard to Canvas here, like I want to say last year, but really I think it was about five years ago, the years they go so fast. When we switched, um, now I was told, you know, oh, there are, there are, wikis page the pages are like wikis and everybody can edit them at the same time do you know what happens when two people edit a canvas page at the same time yeah it's not pretty it, it's i mean i tried to use it just for signups once and like everybody signed up over everybody else and it's like thought wow you know why, why were you all up at midnight on on monday you know it ticked over into the new week of this online class you all tried to sign up at the same time it, it, it was you know it was a bad thing social media tools know how to handle that and you know in some classes right some classes this has to be really purposeful i like the ability to connect out to other people in the world and i think it's valuable for my students um you know whether they're going to do it actively themselves or they're going to be more passive and watch the people who are comfortable doing it go out into the world and make those connections and it can also be the connections with information if you're teaching some classes in an area, for example, that directly connects to um, current events. Yeah, there's so much that's being published out there and having this easy way of sharing things back into the class is, it's just so valuable. Um, but I don't know that I would do it just because, you know, it was fun or whatever. And, and then I would still need to think about what are our private spaces for the class? Um, I wouldn't want to do everything in the social media space. I, I actually teach a class every summer that is explicitly, you know, on the topic, and you know, we're using all sorts of tools. And I would, I would never do this with any other class, right? But the class is about it. So I just say, if you signed up for the class, you signed up for this experience of trying everything. I don't mandate that you try every tool. You can watch us try some of the tools. So. It's just like going to the all you can eat buffet. Right? You don't have to try everything on the buffet. You can fill your plate with you know, a bunch of your two or three favorite things if you want to, or you can have a little bite of everything and that's cool too. Um, and so people have a lot of choice in there. And even though we're doing all of these things and, and people are keeping blogs in the class and we're tweeting to a hashtag and, and I kind of roll it out over time and, and I do it a little different every year because I start to judge how techy my students are and how familiar they are. I don't want to overwhelm them. Um, but at the same time, I still use Canvas. There are certain things for the class that stay inside of Canvas because it's important to you know, keep it private, um, you know, have safe spaces for the students to interact with each other where they know that they're not in front of the rest of the world. Um, for me to share materials with them that I, and I am all about OER and using open materials, but you know what, like there are readings that I want my students to access that are in our library and I've just got to link through to those for them. And there might be other things I want to share that I only have in PDF format. So I'm, I'm going to put them up in Canvas space for them. I'm not going to have them turn in their um, assignments online. If they want to share their assignments on their blog, great but I'm not going to make them do that. We you know, Vanessa, Canvas was developed by a bunch of computer programmers who graduated from BYU and needed something to do. And so there are a lot of 22 and 23 year olds that you know can read small print and can do all these fancy technology things that we don't really need. I mean, they got a lot of bells and whistles. Canvas has got a lot of nice things to it, uh, you know, but it's got a lot of things that we don't need. And the wiki tools, one of those things that you know, could be a lot better. Bill has a question for you, Vanessa. So Bill. 
Um, hello, Vanessa. Um, I'm doing a research uh, to investigate how independent YouTube language content developer perceive informal learning. But I have I met some pro like issues. I'm struggling like if uh, watching educational bloggers videos on YouTube informal learning or formal learning. Um, I'm kind of wanting to change form how to perceive formal learning to learning on social media because people has different perspective on like informal learning and formal learning and students patterns are different as well. Um, so I would like to know how you view this. Well, I think one of the difficulties, oh one of the difficulties on, on YouTube is knowing the intent with which somebody is accessing the video um, and, and whether something is formal or informal learning goes back to that context. So if I'm just, you know, I'm just curious, so I'm going to go on there and look at this video, then that would start to fit under informal learning. Um, now that's me even doing it with intention. So that's some self-directed informal learning, but there are also people who talk about incidental learning, right? So I'm sitting there and I dialed up my YouTube video and I'm watching it. And you know what happens, right? After you watch the first one, it just kind of rolls over with the recommender to the next one. And oh, well, hi, I watched that too. And I learned something from that video. And that might be incidental learning because I wasn't self-directed about it. But then there are the people who are taking a class and either their class in their class, they were told, go watch these videos, right? Sometimes I find great ones and I embed them in the Canvas pages for my students to take a look at them. And then sometimes my students are trying to enhance what they're learning in class, but it still relates back to the class. So it relates back to that formal learning setting. So, I, I mean, the the ways to get at that in research would be, you, you would really need to be talking to the end users somehow. You would need to have surveys or you would need to have interviews. I recognize that it would be really difficult um, to be able to identify in, um, the sample for that unless you've got a, a defined sample for some reason, a defined population who you wanted to talk to in your research. But um, you know, I, I know that a lot of folks want to do research where you're just looking at the analytics that come you know, based on the use, um, look at the comments that are being posted there. And those will tell you certain things, but I don't think they would tell you much about whether or not people were using this for formal or informal purposes. So that's tricky. So we've got time for maybe... Um, we got my audio on here. We got time for maybe two or three questions. Uh, and then you know, we need to let Vanessa have some time to herself tonight. I want to point out that maybe in a year you might see an application from Bill for your doctoral program. So I wanted to at least get her to introduce herself. Um, she's one of our best. Uh, anyone else want to jump in here? Um, Kim, you haven't heard from you with a question. I'm just uh, sitting back and really thinking about things. Um, there was a recent grant that was um, that was funded actually in our state for animal science, social media use at Cornell. Uh, and I know the researcher, um, we're going to be doing something collaboratively in the future when I get back from sabbatical. But um, my question is, um, and I apologize if you already went over this, but um, what, out of all of the social media platforms that are out there, for higher ed use, let's say in a current events outside of education in maybe a, a different discipline, such as disciplines in the sciences or whatever, um, what platform would be, uh, do you think would be most appropriate, like Twitter, Facebook? And I know it really depends on the content, but what, what do you see as moving forward in the future? No, no, Vanessa, before you answer that, we know there are a lot of pigs who have blogs, but we didn't know there were cows. That, that, uh, <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Vanessa, go. Uh, yeah, I, I do think it depends on on um, what you're trying to, to do. I think Twitter can be um, 
really wonderful for sharing and aggregating resources and helping people find different resources and different voices. Um, I, I, like, it, you know, it can just expand your ideas about a field so much. Um, and so integrating Twitter into a class and encouraging, you know, the folks who are comfortable doing so to be ones who are actively sharing with the instructor, of course, modeling, um, you know, leading the way and letting the others be a little bit more passive about it if they just want to watch. And of course, you know, there are ways of making sure that people are following the feed. You can ask them to do a reflection on it um, so that they don't have to have their own um, accounts or, or be on Twitter and be interactive about it if they, they don't want to. Sometimes in some fields, you can point people toward Twitter chats that are taking place, um, whether they choose to, again, get involved actively in it or just passively watch what the professionals in the area are talking about. So that can be really useful. Um, I still think blogs are really useful in education. And there's the EduBlogs platform, which allows you to construct, um, to have blogs more privately and, and hubbed around a central class blog, if that's what you, the way that you want to do it, um, versus having students just create their own with Blogger or WordPress, um, you know, out on the open internet. I, I will tell you that even if they do that, um, people generally don't find the students' blogs and comment on them. It just doesn't happen. So you, know, you can kind of let that fear go away. But if you want to do it in, in a more private way, it is possible. And what I like about blogs, it, it has to be a very intentional use. If you think about blogs as a writing space and discussion boards as a writing space. Discussion boards, um, students tend to view those as being as a space that is owned by the professor, where they are then invited to come comment. The professor sets up the board, the professor sets the topic. Um, you know, even if you do a really good job of creating a student-centered space and let your students, you know, create their own threads, um, you know, un unlock it as much as possible, there is still an orientation toward the instructor that is hard to get rid of. But it does mean that then all of the students are kind of on equal footing with each other as they interact, but they're, they're still orienting toward the instructor in many ways. When you go to blogs, if you have each student create their own blog, now you have to have a good purpose then for them to continue to blog throughout an entire term. You don't wanna just like, hey, let's create a blog today and write a post and maybe we'll do it again in six weeks because it's a really meaningless activity at that point in time. But um, you know, having students create their own blog, they start to recognize right away that, oh, wait, this is my space with my voice. And I have to have something worthwhile to say here. When they start to take ownership of that space, then the, the person who has the blog, you know, they're writing their own little essays and others come and comment on and react to them. Then you start to think about things like reciprocity. Oh, you commented on my blog. Maybe I should go visit your blog and see what you have to say. It just changes the balance of power. And of course, the instructor doesn't own any of these spaces, which is also really nice. So again, you have to be intentional about it. But I think blogs are a really nice tool for, for classes in that way. If you're in a visual field, Instagram might be a, um, a good way to go with it. And people can create multiple Instagram accounts off of their base account. I will say the downside of that is, I mean, Instagram will, if you create a new account, even if you want it to be kind of incognito, it'll start telling everybody who you know that they might want to check out this account and they might pretty quickly figure out that it's you because behind the scenes, the algorithm, you know, it, it, it knows who we are. It knows what we're doing. This class, we used to just do blogging. In my other class, we are doing blogging in the intro class and they are in teams. So they give four people in a team or three or five and they give feedback within their team, which makes a mini community of sorts. I'm experimenting with that a little bit. And it seems to be going quite well. Uh, we have time, maybe she needs uh, to, to, to go, but we maybe have time for one more question. Uh, Kim's got follow-up questions. So after your follow-up, we'll have one more question. Go ahead. I have one more question. Um, so, so I found that the blog that you have is Kim, your, web, your audio is going in and out. I don't know what happened to me. Here, but your audio is something else. Yeah, it's better. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I just had to unplug my microphone. I apologize. So 
Um, I have some students who are what you would say is social media influencers. They have more than 100,000 followers on Instagram. They have built up these social media, I call them empires. One actually has gone full-time on social media um, right after graduation. And it's all related to animal agriculture. And my hesitation with using social media as a platform in my classroom is because um, every February, because they call it February dairy, um, it's like a big time for promotion of the dairy cattle industry. Uh, There are folks on social media who will attack my students on social media. And I'm talking like she showed me the DMs that she gets because she used to we used to edit, um, she used to write for me for a, a regional farming publication. I was their editor and she had her own little thing. And there were death threats to her and her family. Um, and this is not just an isolated thing. This happens to many of my students who try to promote anything about our industry. So what um, what can I do as a faculty member? And this might be maybe a whole research topic because um, it's gotten to the point now where I am I hesitate. Like I want to do this. I see how important it is. And, you know, it gets me really excited even hearing you, but <laughs> the things that people have said on social media to uh, not just one student, but many students is, is really disturbing. So what can I do? Well, you know, you, I think you do have some options still. And, and I agree with you for having some hesitation there because when it gets ugly, it gets ugly. And like you said, you're, so you're dealing with an area where clearly there are people out there who are trying to, you know, find it. I'll tell you, nobody cares about our pre-service teachers who blog about their early experiences using educational technologies. I mean, like nobody cares but there are areas where people care and and um you know so things that you could could think about um you know you could do do this where you allow it to be a little bit more passive for the students and you you know like create a a twitter account that's just for the class it doesn't have a, a clear identity attached to it but the twitter account could um then you like retweet to a hashtag and then everybody could follow on that hashtag. And and so you're getting some information flow happening, but you're not making anybody get directly involved in it. Again, you know, if it's that you want students to follow some of the information flow and maybe even to have students, um, you know, having some conversation about it. Uh, I'm just gonna pick on Twitter again. I mean, you could actually do the same with Instagram. If, If you or like even the whole class are following things on Twitter and Instagram, you could be taking things of interest from there. You can get the embed code and then you could embed the the tweets and the Instagram posts um, like, you know, on blog posts, which you could do on edgy blogs hidden behind the rest of the world, but you could still be bringing them in and you have the look and feel and the ability to comment amongst yourselves in that space. So, um, you know, again, mine it for the content and share and use it in whatever way feels safe for you, because safety um, is of critical importance, I think, I, you know, and that's part of why, you know, I will never force a student to use social media tools in an active way in any class, even, even in my social media class, although I've not had anybody, had anybody like fully take that stance, but I am prepared to customize the experience for them. They have to passively, you know, follow it still. That, that's going to be a requirement, but I will make modifications for people. Um, and, and out there in the natural world, everybody has their own way, right? There are a lot of lurkers. And then there are people, right, who it's not like even just that they're lurkers. They're, they're like, this is my father-in-law, okay? So, um, you know, my, my, my mother-in-law is sitting here and she's doing stuff on her phone. He's like, what's that? What, 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 oh, what's happening there? Oh, like that one, right? So like not even a lurker. It's like, I don't even have an account and I'm an onlooker on somebody else's account, but I, I kind of want to be there and do something. There are so many ways of, of interacting with what happens on social media and using social media. 
I'm going to give you the last voice here. Um, and I, I want you to go to the Jamboard and pick one question that you like that hasn't been asked yet. Where's the Jamboard? Oh, wait, I found the link. Okay, never mind. And Vanessa, thank you. I appreciate it. I really want my students to get attacked in a way because at least I would be able to help them in that where they're not at home or on the job and they're getting attacked. So I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, you can have a class account then. And if your class account gets attacked, you can, it's a learning moment. You can all work through how to do it. And then it's not anybody, it's the class. It's a very different entity. Question, you find a question for, and Vanessa will be, we'll be brief on this one. We'll give our students a break after this. This will be the last one, Christian. Um, you're, muted. you're muted, Christian. Sorry about that. Did you find one, Vanessa, that you was sticking out that you'd like? Well, I'm going to pick on, on and kind of play with this one. So what do you think would be a great way to help young people, teenagers, learn how to best balance their use of social media? You know, they're, they're figuring this stuff out for themselves. They are you know, trial and error um, imperfectly as we do as adults. And if you talk to teens, once they learn that you really are interested in them and you really want to listen, they will point out to you exactly how much adults are hypocrites about all of this. And so, you know, we tell, comment on the way that they're using social media and they're spending too much time on it, et cetera. We do the same exact thing as adults. Now, I do think that we need some stuff to be done in terms of social media education. We can be turning people into more sophisticated users in any number of ways. There, you know, there's like digital literacy and oh, my kid in seventh grade just went through teen safety matters and part of teen safety matters has the digital teen safety matters. And it's all like the gloom and doom and, and yeah, they don't like it. They don't take it that seriously because it's not realistic. It doesn't really speak to how do we become sophisticated users? And sometimes they're more sophisticated users of the medium than, than we are. I think the big, the big thing we all have to grapple with is where and how we think this fits into a curriculum for teens. It's a big issue because social media education, if you think about it in a high school setting, there are a lot of parallels to sex education. The school doesn't want to be responsible for it. The parents don't want to be responsible for it. They're both pointing the fingers at each other on all of this. And mostly everybody just wants to shut it down. But then they get to college and anything goes. And have we prepared our students adequately for the experiences that are going to happen at college? We don't see, I haven't mentioned whether I'm talking about social media use or sex here. Either one fits. Oh, and different families are going to have different values and different tolerance for behaviors among their kids. Um, you know, from like totally shutting something down to wanting them to be educated about the topic to, you know, even you know, saying, well, if you're gonna do this, let's let's figure it out and and do it responsibly we have a long way to go on this. And it's not just telling people to stop sharing their passwords with other people. Um, don't violate copyright. And remember your digital footprint follows you everywhere, kids. So you know, don't use bad words and show yourself drinking a beer if, on Twitter if you hope to be a teacher someday. Up, oh, you're on mute, Kurt. Uh, a lot of solid advice during the last hour, hour and 15 with you, Vanessa. So thank you very much for all your insights, all your research and the future projections of where the field is going. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone has a, a couple more questions backing that up. So Vanessa's email is v, what is v Denon at fsu.edu. I put it in the chat. Okay, thanks. So if you want to, and she's easy to find. 
just type in Google or in there. So it is at vden at fsu.edu. I've typed that enough times that uh, it's locked in my brain. Uh, she's one of the more successful people, one, I should say different, one of the most successful alums of our program and uh, continues to be a colleague with me, even though she graduated in 2001, 21 years ago. So it, we, we bring her back. I come down to Florida State and I speak to her students virtually as well. Uh, it's always a treat to have someone come in who's been so successful in her career uh, and can talk to my students and they can learn not just about what topics they're researching, the field as a whole and how one becomes successful within that field. And Vanessa epitomizes all of that. It's not just her training at Indiana because she was trained at another really good place being Syracuse University, which was the top uh, program in the field um, a few decades ago. And she was also trained at Northwestern, which is also a top-notch school. So her training three places has led her along a, a very productive and fruitful path. But it also helps to have be a generative person, which she is. You saw her generating tons of ideas just as she was speaking, as she was presenting some of those things she didn't even have, she wasn't even thinking at the time as the, her thinking evolved in responding to each of you. So she learned something from this session as well as we did. And so I'd say that's success. Let's give her a round of applause for coming to us tonight. And Vanessa, any final last comment you wanna say? Well, thanks for having me. And actually, Kurt, what you were just saying, I would say that, that, that I think that the biggest thing that makes people successful as academics is an endless sense of curiosity. It's always chasing the answer to the next question. Um, you know, you, you never know it all. You don't, but like, that's, that's the wonderful part is when you realize that you don't know it all, you're never going to know it all. And every day there are more questions and, and more ideas and more studies that you could do. It makes this the best career on earth, I think. And then you get to Kurt, actually, um, I don't know how much you remember this, Kurt, but, but you gave me some advice when I was a student, which was that you go and get a job. And if you don't, if you don't land at a place that automatically has the community that you want, build a community around yourself. And um, that's what I've tried to do with my students and my collaborators. And that is really what has pushed my research forward. And a lot of it has been um, collaborative research opportunities where I get to um, help my students learn to become researchers while we answer the questions that we've dreamed up together. So um, collaborate. Kurt taught me a lot about collaboration. Um, and be curious. Two good C words. And be creative, that's another C word. And think critically about your research is another C word. A lot of C words here. I, I wanna ask Vanessa to share the slides so I can post them into the Dropbox for this class. Uh, so I will do that later on. Those are watching the recording. I will stop the recording at this point. Um, again, never wave. I'm not stopping the show here. I'm just stopping the recording. So those students who are watching online can have some